Hey there, everybody. I am Divinity, and I'm going to be a reader today for you guys for the book Betty Before X. I just wanted to stop and thank all of you and your teachers for allowing me to be here today to read to you guys virtually. This is exciting and something new to all of us. Um, but once again, the book that we're reading is Betty Before X by our author, Ilyasa Shabazz. This is actually a book about Ilyasa's mother, Betty, who is our main character here. And it shows the life of Betty before she married Ma Malcolm X, a uh, civil rights activist, and became one herself. Um, Ilyasa is a third daughter of Betty and is now a motivational speaker and speaks and writes an and is an author about um, a lot of other books such as Growing Up X and her own bi autobiography about her fa father, Malcolm X. Um, so let's go ahead and dive into the book. I want to make sure we get some time. So our first setting is Pinehurst, Georgia, 1934 to 1940. For who hath despised the day of small things? Zechariah 410 KJV. Despise means to hate something or to very much so dislike it. I was just a baby when Grandma Matilda took me away from my mother, not quite one year old. With just a few words forming on my tongue, a few steps wobbling into a walk, I don't know this because I remember. I know this because my Aunt Fannie Mae told me so. We lived in Pinehurst, Georgia, the kind of place you find when you're looking for someplace else, where the sun shined all day long and at night crickets sang song after song. The story goes, Grandma Matilda came for a visit when she picked me up and held me in her arms, taking a good look at me like grandmas do. She found a bruise on my neck. She asked my mother, what happened to this child? And my mother said she didn't know. Grandma Matilda suspected that someone must have done something terribly wrong to me, and so she took me away. After that day, my mother moved to Detroit, and I stayed in Pinehurst with my Aunt Fanny Mae, who took care of me like I was all hers, like I was a gift she had always wanted. She would tell me the story over and over, that my mother was just a baby herself when she had me, Betty, she'd say. She was too young to know what to do with you. And I think this was my Aunt Fanny Mae's way of telling me that I should not go disliking my mother, not go blaming her for leaving me because she didn't know how to raise a baby on her own. But Aunt Fanny Mae knew what to do with me. I don't know how she got so good at loving, how she thought to tell me every day that I was her sweet brown sugar, how she ju knew just when to take my hand in the heart of her palm, holding me tight like she would never let me go. My Aunt Fanny Mae knew how to make me a, make a good day even better. And on bad days, she tried her best to make me feel better. Whenever I was afraid, she knew how to make me believe everything would be just fine. And any question I had, she took her time to answer. But there was one day when she couldn't come for me, couldn't answer my questions. It was the first time my Aunt Fanny Mae looked frightened. It was the first time I saw a lynching. A lynching is to put to to put a person to death, um, especially by hanging, by mob action that has no justice behind it. Um, I just wanted to go over that vocabulary word in case anybody didn't know. We were on our way home from buying groceries at the market. Aunt Fanny Mae was telling me about the cobbler she was gonna make, how she was going to mix the brown sugar and cinnamon with the butter and the fruit we bought, and then she just stopped talking. She snatched me up real fast with one hand and held me close to her heart. The apples and peaches fell from the bit left from her left hand and rolled out of the bag. I looked at Aunt Fanny Mae's face and followed her eyes. They were looking at one of the magnolia trees down the road. The tree had two bodies, a man and a woman's, dangling from the branches like two heavy Christmas ornaments. Close your eyes, baby, she said to me. I don't know how long we stood there, but it was long enough for me to see fear in my Aunt Fanny Mae's eyes and feel the fear in my heart. My aunt was frozen and silent, and the only sound I could hear was her deep breathing, in, out, in, out but i couldn't look away i loved that tree just the day before my friends and i had climbed it we stretched our hands out as far as the tips of our fingers could go touching the winds trying to reach heaven and now negro bodies were swaying from it side to side side to side close your eyes betty aunt fanny may said again she put me down and we turned around we'll walk the long way home she moved fast pulling me along because my stride was shorter than hers and i could barely keep up she squeezed my hand, never letting me go. We left the fruit and the bodies behind. The whole way to our house, I wondered which would rot faster. When we got home, we were quiet through supper, and when bedtime came, 
Aunt Fanny Mae kissed me and said, Don't you ever forget how much Aunt Fanny Mae loves you, Betty. But even with all of her love, I still had many questions. I asked for Aunt Fanny Mae, Who killed that man and woman? She said she didn't know. I asked for Aunt Fanny Mae, Why do Negro people die that way? She said she didn't know. Aunt Fanny Mae must have known I had more questions that she couldn't answer because that's when she told me. Baby, some things we just have to take to the Lord. We have to pray for this world and ask God to help us. You know, God is always there to listen, baby. We can take all of our burdens and questions to him. You hear me? So after each day settled into the black sky, my questions rose like the moon, hovering over me all night till I fell asleep. Most nights, I asked the same questions over and over. What did I do to make my mama leave me? What can I do to make her love me? I lived with my Aunt Fanny Mae until I was six, and when I turned seven, that's when my Aunt Fanny Mae died. In just one day, I learned how love can disappear in an instant, like how if you blink, you can miss the setting sun. And one day, my Aunt Fanny Mae went to heaven, and I moved to Detroit. Detroit, Michigan, 1945. You can't sing about love unless you know about it. Billy Eckstein, old-time singer. If you guys want to see the nice little pictures. Betty, Betty, I hear my sister calling my name. Betty, Juanita's whispers floats across the room. She shares a bed with Jimmy. I share a bed with Shirley. When we were little, I didn't mind sharing a room with my three younger sisters. Our small bodies didn't take up much space, but now I am 11. And most nights, Shirley's knees end up in my ribs. Her arms stretch out across my neck. The covers mostly just cover her. And not it's not sharing a bed that's so bad. It's how Juanita wakes up in the middle of the night every night needing to use the bathroom but too afraid to go into the hallway by herself even th though we have a nightlight in our room and one in the hallway betty will you go with me Juanita is whining now and her voice is getting louder i don't want her to go alone or come or wake up shirley and jimmy so i slide out of bed come on i whisper holding out my hand in the dark Juanita takes it and we tiptoe to the bathroom i wait for her outside the door leaning my sleepy body against the wall there's a family photo next to me that I can barely see in the darkness, but I know it by heart because it's been hanging there since I moved here four years ago. I am not in it. It's the first thing I noticed when Ali Mae brought me home from the train station and took me to my bedroom, which is when I found out Ali Mae was not just my mother, but also the mother of three other girls, Shirley, Jimmy, and little Juanita. And she was not just a mother. She was also a wife to Arthur Burke, who had two sons of his own. One was named Henry and the other Arthur, who everybody calls Sonny. So in one day, I went from having one aunt, one grandma, and a bunch of baby dolls to having a mother, a father, three baby sisters, and two younger brothers. Juanita comes out the bathroom yawning a thank you, and it only takes her a few seconds to fall asleep once she's in her bed. I close my eyes and replay these memories over and over every night, but not only the good memories have stayed, sometimes when I'm not even trying, I see those magnolia trees the blooming white flowers, and the thick brown branches with Negro bodies hanging. A tree can never just be a tree after seeing that. I lie on my back, then my stomach, then my side. I kick my leg out from under the covers, pull them back over me, take them off again. I fall asleep talking to God. Is my Aunt Fanny Mae there with you, Lord, looking down on me, watching everything that's going on? Does my Aunt Fanny Mae know how much I miss her, how much I love her? Will Ollie Mae ever look at me the way she looks at my sisters? I toss and turn, toss and turn, and think about the pho photograph in the hallway, then back to my Aunt Fanny Mae, then I think of those haunted trees again. I think that maybe all these memories are another reason I still feel like a stranger here. Even though I'm far away from Pinehurst, I've brought the South with me. Sunday sunlight fills our room the next morning. I feel like I just closed my eyes and it's already time to wake up and get ready for church. After church, Suzetta, my best friend, says to Phyllis, my other best friend, is coming over to my house. We're going to listen to Billy Eckstein records and bake cookies. You want to come? We spend the next hour turning pages and pointing out who we think is cute, which outfits we're going to get, and which hairstyles we will wear. I stare at the spread that's right in the middle of the magazine. Ooh, I'm going there, I tell them. Rose Meadows House of Beauty in New York City. One day I'm going there to get my hair done, I say. Can you imagine all of us getting our hair done in Harlem? We read, we read the article out loud, taking turns. Phyllis goes first. She reads the headline. Rose Meadows, House of Beauty, biggest Negro salon in the world. Then me. Rose Meadows opposes the idea that kinky hair is inferior. 
her philosophy is that there is beauty in everyone i read there's a quote right next to a photo of a hairdresser pressing a woman's long thick black hair hair like mine i read the rest of it no negro hair is bad all negro hair is attractive i stop at an ad that says is your skin dark dreadful and unattractive so is mine the woman in a magazine has tan skin like the inside of an almond like suzetta and phyllis's skin she is holding a bottle with a label on it that reads miss emma's bleaching cream for a lovelier lighter complexion at the corner of the page there's a picture of the same woman before she used the cream her skin is brown not tan i flip back to the spread about miss rosmetta and her beauty salon in harlem i look at all the women sitting in the chair getting their hair straightened curled cut and pinned up all of them are tan i'm so distracted that i don't realize phil is talking to me betty you hear me next sunday we're going to style each other's hair okay we can each turn take turns being miss Ramez rose meta i close the magazine okay the front door opens and Suzetta's family comes in. Uncle Clyde in the front with the rest of his family following behind him. Aunt Nita is holding Bailey Allen, who's a ball of sleep cuddled up against her chest. Then Suzetta asked me if I wanted to bake cookies. Suzetta then opens up the oven and says, they smell so good. Kay pours the milk and we eat our chocolate chip cookies without waiting for them to cool. Our mouths are full and there are no more talking for a while. Everyone is enjoying the cookies. I don't bother bringing up the ad about a lighter, lovelier skin complexion. Don't ask Suzetta or Phyllis or Kate if they notice that none of the girls in the magazines are brown. Like me. Christmas is next week. Suzetta and I will need to finish getting our Christmas gifts. I have something for everybody on my list except Shirley. We don't normally shop at JL's, but Kay saw an advertisement about a holiday sale at Toy Town, so we are going to shop for Shirley and Bernice. Finally, after 15 more minutes of waiting, Kay says, Okay, I'm ready. We head outside and walk down the block to the trolley. We get on the line, headed in the direction of JL's, and go straight to the back of the car. The closer we get to the JL's, the more white folk get on. Once we arrive, there are hardly any Negroes in sight. The people shopping, the people working behind the counter, the models in the advertisements, all white. The only people who aren't white are the ones operating the elevators. Kay says, You two stay close to me, okay? Walking through JL's, I notice all white people looking at us, but quickly looking away to avoid meeting our eyes, except for the little girl who is staring at me right now. She is holding on to her mother's hands, eyes big and looking right at me. I wave. She looks away too, like she didn't even see me saying hello. When we get to Toy Town, we stare inside the display windows. There's a whole Christmas scene with a train riding around a snowy track. I see all the miniature townsmen and townswomen stationed throughout the imaginary village. All of the figurines are white, not one Negro. We walk into the store. I try not to notice if anyone is looking at us. I just keep my eyes focused on the toys, trying to find the aisles where I can get a play tea set for Shirley. There they are, Suzetta shouts. She's pointing to a long shelf ahead of us. There are all kinds of tea sets displayed. I choose a set that has enough dishes for me, Shirley, Jimmy, Juanita, and even Juanita's imaginary friend to each have her own tea. Kay helps me get the box down and Suzetta grabs one too for Bernice. As we wait our turn at the register, a white woman steps in front of us. At first, I think maybe she's passing through to get to the other side of this crowded store, but she sets her item down on the cash register counter. I look up at Kay, who's looking furious but not saying anything. I want her to say something. I want to say something. I want to say, excuse me, ma'am, but we're standing here. Don't you see us? The woman pays for her things, collects her shopping bags from the clerk, and walks out the store, not looking back, not even thanking us for letting her cut in front of us. The man at the counter doesn't speak or look at us in the eye. He doesn't make small talk with us about the weather, like he did with the woman. When I pay him, he takes my money and that's it. No thank you, no Merry Christmas, nothing. I take my bag without saying thank you and Kay nudges me. Mind your manners, she whispers. Thank you, I mumble. He just looks up at me. We walk away. I wanted to stop there because it starts to get really good. This book is super, super, super good about making sure that everybody understands the differences in rights in people back when that time was a time and how Betty was just discovering this and how she couldn't quite understand it as a child and how she had to grow up and really embrace it. So I really think that it's worth a read and I could only read a few parts of chapters. So I really suggest that everybody goes and reads it.
it was such a pleasure. Thank you for having me.